Well, here we are, guys. Episode eight of the first series, Sunday Tivlands Live, and I'm John, uh, joined by my co-host as always, John Murphy and Keith Knox. Guys, you all right? All good. Thank you. All good. Just um, looking forward to this episode, and I guess it's good for us to review how the first seven episodes has went, and obviously today being the eighth, and I think it's quite um, it's quite positive to look back to you know episode one where we came, really nervous, didn't really know where the show was going, to now look back and see we've had Jean-Michel Sieve, Michael Mies, Liam Pittsford, Johnny Cowan, Omar Assar, Will Bailey. You know, we've had fantastic guests, and I think it, it generally has been very, very positive, and I think it's um, a good opportunity to bring uh, table tennis to the forefront during these difficult times. We were nervous, episode one, John, remember? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the biggest thing closing off season one is that we've all grown as uh, as as co-hosts. Um, obviously, we were I was I was stuck to the chair on on on, on episode one, and, and uh, I didn't get off for for five hours after the episode. But now I have to say it was, it, it's been it's been great for us. I know for myself, you know, blocking it in on a Sunday, and and it's definitely uh, helped me as a coach uh, to, to learn new things, especially from the quality guests that we've had on so yeah i'm looking forward to to a great episode coming up and and re recapping season one and looking at the, the the best moments well it will be nice to get a little break keith because me and you put a lot into the show and john does join us uh, on a sunday but you know it's be nice to have a little break on a, you know, all the rest <laughs> of the days leading up to the show wouldn't it yeah the, the, thing, the thing is when you when, when you bring it when you bring expertise you know it's it's you, you come in you give you give the good tips and then you you, you leave and, and and i suppose that that's what i offer this show well, well you told us on uh, messenger that season two you'll bring the big guests you know we got we still got a lot lined up for season two so um, you know adam bobro will be joining us for sure and there's you know maybe aruna and a couple of other big names joining us but we need to get some females on we have been trying we've been reaching out to some of the top female players it hasn't happened as yet but we will Obviously, Will on last week was was exceptional to get the insight into Power Tillens as well as being a champion. So yeah, we've done well, I think, over the last uh, seven episodes. And who have we got for episode eight? So yeah, massive name in um, Omasa. Number one in Africa. Um, I know Aruna's knocking the door and they do have a ding dong when they play each other and beat each other. But um, some guy, um, well done there, Keith, um, bringing him in because that was a good coup. Yeah, no, it was quite, it was just by complete chance actually we got him on. Um, he actually reached out to us on Instagram saying that we're doing a great job, which was quite quite flattering given, you know, we're, it's difficult in these times, you know, there's not much happening and we're trying to stay positive. Alan, um, our journalist for TT Fit, uh, puts out articles and puts out interviews and different bits and pieces. So I think he must have noticed maybe our Pitchford interview on the Sunday Table Tennis Live. Um, and from then he got in touch and here we are. He's on, on the show today. He's a top, top player, John, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think Keith mentioned he, he, he's been top 16 in the world in the discussion we had earlier this week and you know to get to that level you've obviously you've obviously had big wins along the way and then some great results and um, from my own experience with, with Omar I've, I've probably come through at, at a similar time to him he's a couple of years younger than me so I've seen him as a junior seen him progress there and seen what a player he probably could be and, and, and it's great to see where, he, where he's gone from there and um, I'll be interested to ask him a few questions along those lines and, and, and really dig deep to see how he's really become such a good player coming out of Africa. Well, I think he's only a few years younger than me as well, but um, I'm not quite sure about that. But um, yeah, well, let's bring him on. Without further ado, Omasa.
So welcome to the show, Omar. It's great to have you on. Thanks for giving up some of your time to join us and watching back those clips. Like we all know how good you are, but watching back those clips, you know, it's, it's fantastic to see how much power you got, speed, agility. <laughs> what do you think about watching that back? Well, I'm very happy that I'm with you today, really, and I would like to thank you for this nice video, guys. Really, it's uh, one of my nice points, and I was very happy to see it, and I think it's lots of efforts also to make the montaging for this video and to cut and to choose the right points. And, and it took me a long time, I, Omar. It took me a long time to get yeah. that sorted, so yeah. Um, but <laughs> I'm, I'm going to share it later. <laughs> After the video, I'm going to share it as well, and I'm going to mention... Fantastic. All the efforts you did, you guys. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, I'm going to uh, list off uh, some of your, your main achievements and, and best parts of your table lens career. Um, born 22nd of July 1991 in Kafrel Sheikh, Egypt. Is that correct? Did I pronounce that right? Kafrel. Okay, sorry. Kafrel Sheikh, yes. Yeah. Um, so you were part of, with the Futures in Mind ITTF program. At the All African Games, you've won three gold, two silver, three bronze. The African Championships, seven gold three silver, one bronze, African Cup, gold in 2015, African top 16, you won bronze in 2014, Mediterranean Games, gold in 2013, Pan Arab Games, gold and silver in 2011, All African Games, two times gold medals, one times silver, World Team Cup, bronze in 2013, highest world rank in 16, Olympic Games, you've already been to two Olympics in 2012 in London and Rio in 2016. Um, Egyptian table tennis is obviously improving from, you know, I don't know, maybe 10, 15, 20 years uh, before where yourself, your brother, um, so many other great players, Dina, uh, Misharev, Hannah Gorda is coming through as well. So there must be some, you know, obviously a lot of good coaching, a lot of good, you know, progress in the country and and in Africa in general, which is fantastic to see. I agree with you. And as well, we have the culture of the of the base of the sport that the people love to see and they play. Of course, Egypt has a fantastic weather. People love to play in the beach. They play in schools, they play outside. And um, this is also what brings in so many players in the young age. The, the important now how to engage as more more player as you can as much player as you can into the professional yeah. sport yeah. that after they finish the high school they engage more and this is i can see also that i have a main responsibility in this to have a good example for the young players that he, they can create a career through table tennis mm. still at the moment unfortunately the table tennis is not taken um, absolutely serious that okay I can take it as a career it's always still 95% of the kids that it's okay I'm going to play in my free time beside my job mm. at my school beside my university yeah, sure. not a full-time job and this is what I would love to change in the future yeah I think we all got those challenges from Wales with myself and, and John uh, in Australia and Keith with Ireland, you know, we got those same uh, issues and problems. So I think yeah. there's, we're all trying to be role models for those, you know, things to improve in the future, I think. But John's got yeah. the uh, John's got the first question. So I'll leave yeah, it with please. John. Go ahead. Omar, um, great to have you on the show. Um, first Thank question you. for me, um, tell us a little bit about uh, the ITTF and the project that you were supported in with the future in mind and, and, and what that meant for your career and how that helped you on the path to become the player you are? Well, it's a very good question. I, I must say it's a very good opportunity for me to thank the International Table Tennis Federation. Um, it has been always a great help for the players who, who needs this help because in Egypt, like you say, we have the base, but if you want to take the next step, you need education you need to know how this um oh thank you my love sorry my wife was bringing the charger fantastic <laughs> for mac <Yeah. laughs> um so i just want to say that um through ittf it has been a great chance to get to know what the other people think about table tennis in a professional way how to take it like a job with a certain hours of work with um, 
quality time, not only that you are there physically in the hall. So this was the two main parts that made the ITF thought, okay, we are going to give a hand and a big chance for the players who want to fight, who wants to fight for their future, and they don't have this kind of abilities and to send them to the right places. So from here, I would like to thank generally the ITTF for to give me this opportunity. To be honest, they didn't not only gave me, they gave, it was a, a project was full of players from Egypt, from Africa, from Latin America, from Iran, from everywhere almost. And then they had some kind of tests or some kind of chances that, okay, if the player going to take one of those chances, we keep him. If not, then we, we choose another player. So I guess what I want to know is how has things changed um, in Egypt, you know, since since you were a kid? compared to what it's like now? Uh, um, I, I'm going to shock you with this, to be honest. I, I want I want to be very direct. When I was a kid, it was better. Really? It was far better. It was far better than now. I can tell you my, um, my how can I look to, uh, at it. I mean, when I was young, the, the things that coaches they had this kind of system, the Chinese system, like coaches are working with a certain players and they take them all the way until they reach a certain level. And the coaches see, see it as um, a way of success. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do whatever it takes me to fix Omar's forehand and then Omar's backhand and then Omar's physical. And each part we work until it comes to a certain level doesn't matter how long it takes, can take up to one year with one skill, can take less, can take more. At the moment, I can see, I don't want to be very um, generalized or something in my look, but many of the of it at the moment is jumping between players. Okay, I come with this player, I work per hour. If I find another player who can pay more per hour, I go to him. Yeah. And then the, the player is confused because he gets two, two um, different opinions from two different coaches. Mm -hmm. And also the coaches start again from scratch with a new player. And this is, I would say, not only in Egypt, but in the Arab world and in Africa. They are, even the countries where they got lots of um, possibilities, like the Gulf countries, for example, they have possibilities, they have money, they have coaches but then they change the coaches every year almost mm -hmm. then the coaches has to start again with players and then the player once they get used to one coach then change then he has to adapt to another coach mm -hmm. so at, at the time when i was living in egypt i liked it so much because the player the coaches was very determined to reach the their player they, actually it was more a relation like uh, a, son, a father and a son more, more than um, coach and player. Yeah. Take a big responsibility. Sometimes a coach was picking me up from home because I have no time, I need to study. He was picking me up from home and again, delivering me to home and giving a report to my uh, to my father and mother. Yeah, okay, Omar needs to work on his core. Please, between the lessons, he needs to do this and this exercise. We didn't have the time to do it at, at the club. We need to do it, do it at home. So it was this kind of relation. At the moment, I don't see it that often. I see it's a more um, a short-term business-wise. I want to take as much uh, money per hour now. And actually, the coaches, when they have a long-term vision, of course, when the player start to have sponsors and start to have a world ranking, then the earnings would not be only for the player, but will be for the whole team. Player, coach, physical coach, mental coach, and all. But it needs patience, it needs vision, it needs also some kind of self-confidence. That the coach knows that he has a knowledge, he's self-confident, and knows that, okay, I can reach the player to this certain point, and then things are going to be better, and the payment will also be better. Yeah. And just with regards to Egypt, you know, is there a lot of money in Egypt for table tennis? Is, is table tennis a popular sport in Egypt? Have you helped um, with the popularity um, of table tennis? Or how, how are things um, in Egypt with regards to table tennis? Well, this is what the thing that it's better now than 10, 15 years ago, for example. Because uh, 
the people start to look for alternatives, not only for football, because football has been disappointing in the last two, three years with the results. Of course, they are doing their best, but the results for people was under the expectations, especially the African title and the Arab title and this, we were not as uh, high as we should have been in the last years. Therefore, sponsors start to get in, and uh, I personally have uh, two of the greatest companies in Egypt, the Farco one, the company in Egypt for pharmaceuticals, and another company as well, uh, Global Brands, and this besides, of course, of Butterfly. So you can see now much more than before, definitely. Yeah. However, now you need to use it in the right way. You need to use it not only to bring cash in for the players, but to use it that some kind, like I said before, a long-term investment. So the money is definitely more. The way of using the money needs to develop. Fantastic. Very interesting. Um, so you were number 16 in the world, which is a fantastic achievement, obviously. Can Omar go even higher? I believe, yes. I believe I can go higher. In, I reached 16 in the world and I felt, yeah, okay, it was a very big step. And then I started to think, how can I go further? This was 2017. How can I go further? Then I started for some private coaches. I did some own decisions. Uh, many of them went in the wrong direction. I was trying to develop my game and then I get some coaches in and then um, of course I didn't get the enough time for them to to be creative enough mm -hmm. so because I I'm living in Germany I'm not living in Egypt so of course it was not so easy to hire a coach where I need to have a place for him to live and place for him to train and also the, the, the um, everything it was self-management and then after a while I, fi I find it very heavy for me to manage the booking and the, the year schedule, the camps and all the other arrangements. That's why it went in the other direction. Then I sank a little bit. I went actually uh, out of the top 50 in the world. And this is one of the blessings in Europe that it's not a one-man show. If you see in Egypt, even the young stars and this, they are all self-management. Uh, even the parents or them themselves, they self-managed everything. Of course, you do many mistakes because you are everything you do it by your, of, of course, some part of emotional part comes in, yeah. some part yeah. of, of, I mean, you don't have a real guide. But when the Federation do it like Germany, look at Germany or look at Sweden, they do everything under a system. And of course, they have been doing this for so many years, so they have doing so many mistakes and they got to learn from the mistakes and many things to improve and it's much more solid than one man show. And this is was uh, the main problem when I started to do it. But I come back to your 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 um, uh, your question that you said, how can I go further than this or if I can go further? I believe yes, because now I am trying to think not only from the emotional side, but also I'm trying to see and look around what the other player can do. I see uh, some players from my generation, which are I'm very happy that they reach it farther, like Matthias Falk, for example, played with him three years in Halmstad Club, and he's exactly the same age. I'm trying to see what is he can do so that I can also apply in my uh, in my system. Uh, Patrick Franziska and Hugo Calderano, Simon Gozi, all these stars, and uh, Quadri Aruna, of course, and um, how can I see, ah, okay, what can I do that I can also take in my uh, program or in my system? And I think now things are getting slightly better. Good. Okay. Excellent. Omar, you've had, some, you've had some amazing achievements throughout your career so far. If you were to pick, pick one, one result or one achievement that you've achieved, uh, what would that be? What's your greatest achievement? I would pick two, if you allow me. Yeah, we allow that. <laughs> I, uh, uh, as a junior, I, I was um, in China Open 2009 in Chengdu. And for me, this was very important to uh, show up a good result internationally. I was winning some junior circuit pro, um, tournaments, but not in Asia. It was mostly Africa and Europe. 
So I was very happy that it was my first Asia title as a junior that I won China Open. Of course, it feels very special when you win a title in China. Mm. This is this was very special for me. This is the first. The second, I would say, um, the All African Games 2011. It was directly after a shoulder surgery. It was a dream for me to be the first Egyptian player who win it, win this title. Toriola was winning the same title for 16 years, four, four times in a row. And it was great for me to win um, over this legend in the quarterfinal and then to win the title as well. So I would pick these two for the moment. Of course, there are many others that I am very proud of, like the World Cup bronze in 2013 with team and also the, um, some world tours as well. But this one, I'm very proud of it, these two. Awesome. Um, you alluded to it there about African table tennis. It's really on the up. It's certainly improving a lot. You know, obviously with yourself and Quadri Aruna, you know, you guys have had some phenomenal results. Um, you know, what what is it that you see that, that Africa is doing differently that now, you know, the level is improving all the time? Um, I would say the first thing comes to my mind is uh, also hosting the competitions. I think by hosting competitions and allowing uh, foreign players to come in so the young players in your country can see them live, not only how they perform, because of course they can see it on YouTube or in ITV or something, but also they see the full package, how the players prepare before the match, how they train in practice hall, how they, uh, what's the rituals of the players before the match, how they celebrate, how they get angry and anger man management, they, they see everything and then they try to imitate they try to see what they can do in their own game and um, i'm very proud that nigeria is hosting now very stable uh, a world tour every year egypt as well used to have this but unfortunately not in the recently years and i hope that it comes back that egypt can organize um, this kind of event what i also would love uh, that can be in the future is that allowing the players to compete in the local leagues and this is what Germany did and they mastered. I think Germany is very good that they allowed the, the big stars, the Swedish big stars, Jürgen Persson, Jano Waldner and very big play, uh, players to compete in the Bundesliga. In that time, Sweden was directly after China, and then now Germany replaced Sweden, and they now number two after China. And I think one of the key points is the local uh, competition and the hosting. Germany is one of the fewest country in the world which is hosting two Platinum World Tour every year. Yeah, so this kind of things, I think this these things can people think, oh, okay, how can we do it? But I think this what can be. Um, with some um, hard work in the marketing area that you can bring some sponsors in and then you can have a very well organized um, events. This can also do like exactly like Nigeria, not only Aruna, but of course Aruna is the leader now after uh, Turiola and you can find many young players in Nigeria are coming as well. Very good. So apart from our love for table tennis, we got something else in common. We both play for Dusseldorf, and um, oh. so moving to Dusseldorf yourself, you know what? It was a huge step, obviously. Can you tell us more about the details of the training and the people you practice with and the setup? Of course, I'm I'm very lucky to be part of the uh, of the team here in Dusseldorf and the practice group. It's a it's um it's a very nice thing to see. It's a big center with a very well organized, and it's a cooperation actually between Borussia Dusseldorf club and the German Table Tennis Federation and they are doing amazing job. I I would like to also see this opportunity to thank them because especially in the Corona time they did amazing job to keep the players active and to keep the player even in when it was a very strict regulations. Still we have a very strict regulations but especially when it was in the peak how they made it with only two players and one coach in one hole which is usually takes up to 30 tables. So the coaches and the trainers were there up to 10 hours per day. It was very exhausting for them. 
and it was also how to take care that we can keep the distance between the players and clean and we also players we um we followed all the instructions to keep the things running because we wanted to keep on practicing so this is one thing in general here is the center is very well organized between the physical trainer and the technical training and uh, the place around is very green so it also makes you feel you are in the right place and healthy place and um, if i come to the practice group you can easily pick 10 players from the best 50 players in the world this is amazing you can find great players like Timo Ball, Dima Ofcharov. You can find also some young players who are coming up right now, like, for example, Dan Q, like Benedict Doda. Like, you can find also some foreign players from Latin America from everywhere. This is really amazing, and I'm very happy that I'm part of this uh, project or part of this training. And um, every day, I would like to be one of the best players in the in the group of this session. This what make me. I think when I was playing in Werder Bremen. The first half was very nice for me in the Bundesliga. I made, I was one of the best players in the Bundesliga in the first half. And then uh, when Andreas Preuss, the manager of Dusseldorf, uh, had with me the, the meeting and he gave me the offer, I was very happy and I directly, I think I signed very fast because I wanted to be in this um, in very professional group. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Um, Omar, you obviously uh, you're 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 familiar to the World Tour and you're 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 out playing a lot of tournaments all the time. What what's your thoughts on the on the new World Table Tennis uh, twenty twenty one that the ITF are going to launch? And um, do you have any thoughts on that? I I also must be um, very um, how to say I, I would like to be very open and very direct with you. Uh, I was a guy always who is counting the world ranking and see every decision of the ITF, how, how it will be uh, efficient for the players and this and this and this. And for me, I found it distracting. I, I, for, I, didn't, I missed the basics. I missed this kind of how to improve every day and how to look to my own weaknesses, physically, technically and mentally. I start to, especially when I start to be top 20 player, I was very hungry to come into top 10. And this was one of the mistakes that if some young players are watching me, I would like to also advise them that wherever you go with your career, you need to keep a minimum, um, uh, how to say, a minimum important or a minimum interest in your everyday work that how can I improve my weaknesses today? What can I do today in the session? How can I be more creative? So I come back to your question. I just want to say that I am not that guy who is following every single decision from the International Table Tennis Federation. Not, not because of I am ignoring, not at all, but because I have this kind of trust that if you um, work in your weaknesses as a player, especially that I don't have a private coach and I don't have a big organization behind me who can do this other uh, work. I'm more uh, concerned of my own weaknesses than the world tour or the new names or this and this and this. So to be honest, I don't have so much to comment about it. And I'm more focused in my own weaknesses at the moment. Yeah, very, very fair, very fair. It's a good attitude to have. Focus on yourself and make sure you improve and let the rest take care of itself. It's true, <laughs> but not because I'm, I'm ignoring, really. Well, I think no. all, four, all four of us just want table lens to improve all the time. So that's the yeah. main thing, isn't it? Absolutely. We all we all want it to be a success. Absolutely. So, Omar, you've you've played in two Olympics, and um, I'm sure you were looking forward to the Olympics uh, this year in Tokyo. Obviously, now pushed back. Um, what can we expect from Omar Asar in Tokyo? Well, Olympic Games is such an amazing event to play. I, I was very happy and lucky to participate in Rio and London. And I was very inspired by Quadri Aruna, how he reached the quarterfinal and beating so big players in Rio de Janeiro. I would really love to compete with myself that I want to perform better this time. I'm also 
I see it in a very positive way that it's a chance for me to keep improving until next year. And probably also we will have it as a family. Um, I, I was talking with my wife and, uh, and uh, that she won't like to come with me to Japan to support. And this, I find it very amazing to have the family behind you when I'm now qualified, I'm very happy. I'm also qualified in all the three possible categories. Like I am in team event, singles event, and double mix with Dina Mesher. So this is very nice. It's going to be a long a competition for me, full of um, emotion, full of training, full of this. So I would really love that my wife and my son can join me in Tokyo next year. And I'm going, like I said, I'm going to improve every day as much as I can, that I can perform better than last time in Rio. And to also be more realistic, no one can just judge the results. You can, you saw Jorgen Persson, for example, he already retired before Beijing. He was starting his coaching career. Then he decided to come back before the qualification. He qualified and then he was in semi final. Mm -hmm. This is unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Waldner as well, and many other players. So it's not only the training, but the training and mindset and draw and and um, many, many things can come together that you need to be in this day in your peak, yeah. that you perform very well. So I hope I'm one of those guys that can perform very well in Tokyo uh, 2021. Well, <laughs> Sounds very strange, right, to say Tokyo 2021. I know, it does sound strange. It does sound strange. Well, talking about uh, Swedish table tennis, and there's another thing we got in common. Um, we both played in the Swedish top league. Um, what has Sweden brought to your game? What, how, how do you develop when you were in Sweden? A lot, a lot. I, I am very thankful to all the Swedish coaches, uh, ahead of them, Peter Carlson, of course, because he was taking care of me. I was his first player as a coach. And um, like I said in the beginning of this video, um, Peter changed the mindset between a free time sport to a professional sport how to take it, how to, what are you going to do in the two and a half hour in the morning training and the three hours in the afternoon training and the quality, not quantity, all these principles was for me very practical and I was very lucky to, to use them. Also, I'm very thankful to Ulf Carlson and all the Halmstad people because they accepted me and they, and the Falkenberg club as well. How could they say, ah, okay, uh, he's a foreigner player. How can we inhabit a win-win situation? that he have a positive effect in the training group and we give him the chance to compete in the Binks League and in the top league. This was very important and a very professional way of thinking. I, uh, I admire it and I would like really Egypt to start to apply this actually and, and have some foreign players and accept them in the society and give them the way to um, to open their mind and to be professional in the Egyptian league as well. Thanks. Brilliant. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Um, Omar, uh, tell us a little, tell us and, and the viewer a little more about yourself, like off the table, what you do to relax, what your, what your ambitions outside the game and maybe who your best friends are from the, from the tour. Well, um, I, I actually have, not so big um, things I can do good away from table tennis. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I have tr tried, I, I mean, I've studied business administration in, in, in the Cairo University, and then I didn't find myself there in the studying. However, in Egypt, in the society, you need to finish uh, all the way after university degree. You need to take at least bachelor. So this, therefore, after I finished my bachelor degree, I find it, uh, okay, like uh, an exit and uh, a door of freedom. Now I only play table tennis, so I was very happy. <laughs> like you see, I'm I'm out of the table. I'm like this in this hangar here and in, in the bathroom, <laughs> <Yeah. the fans>. relaxing, <laughs> having a cup of coffee. Beautiful. <laughs> I I also like to make coffee, and this not so many people knows about me. I love to um, like some kind of a barista. So I have a professional machine at home and I would like to prepare my own coffee, invite my friends for a, a, a coffee, a nice espresso or cappuccino or something. And uh, I draw for them some, some drawings like a tulip or flowers or hearts or something. 
So I, this is I've got an idea. Yes, You're please. A very uh, business oriented education. You love coffee, you love table tennis. You should open up a table tennis coffee shop and then have tables there, have a coffee. That's the future. It should be amazing. That's the future, maybe. Amazing. <laughs> really just amazing. Like, yes, it just amazing. like Michael Mee is in, in Denmark. Yeah, he's opened yes. up his uh, restaurant there. So um, we had Michael on yes. on uh, week four, I think it was, wasn't it? That Michael came on and told us about his restaurant. So maybe in the future, we'll see the Omasa coffee shop with table tennis tables inside. I think that'll be a good move. This is very cool. This I think, a very good idea. <laughs> I think it would work. What about, um, obviously, we come to the end of the questions, but I've just got one more for you. Obviously, Mohamed Salah um, is playing this afternoon. Um, Liverpool are playing Everton. So just about to win the Premiership. Um, obviously, big news in Egypt. But um, he's he loves his table tennis as well. What about uh, Omar yes. Asar versus Mohamed Salah match? That will be a good one. This would be great. This would be really great. I actually, um, I gifted him my uh, my racket. So I sent I sent it to him, my racket uh, to to the club, and uh, just a few days ago. So I hope it reached soon. Good. So once yeah. I got uh, my racket from Butterfly, I sent it to him because I know how much he loves table tennis, and I had uh, a very nice word to him. I said uh, that he made us all proud. Yeah. with what is he doing and uh, because also off of the court he is a very good example of an athlete yeah. this is very important um here in table tennis too you can find a very good examples of the table i mean when you speak with vladi samsonov when you speak with timo when you speak with quadri aruna when you speak with michael mays with uh, jürgen person i mean this kind of, of examples they are you, you're gonna also they don't have the table all the time with them outside they always speak about other things and they are very humble and they have very sense of humor and so this makes people love them so much and support them all the way especially when they don't perform that good that you can see many people behind them even in the tough times and this is where the true fans are yeah good answer well thank you very much for your time for your honesty for your insight uh, me, Keith and John are going to be watching your career, obviously, unfold. We'll see you on the tour again somewhere and we'll have a coffee next time we meet up. That'd be nice. Of course. You are all welcome, guys, for a nice coffee. Thank you, Omar. Thanks, Omar. Omar. <laughs> Stay safe. So, yeah, Omar, what a character. Um, good insight, good knowledge, very calculated. Um, even quite interesting, really, that he didn't get embroiled into you know, opinions about the new world tour. He just wants to let it unfold and just concentrate on himself. And that's pretty refreshing, really. What do you think, John? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I was very interested when he said when he hit 16 in the world and what the problems of that pose for him as well. We, we've had that as uh, ourselves. I know an example close at home for us and going through my head was Ashley Robinson when he when he reached his career height. Um, I think he was around 300 in the world and the old rank and he had a really good world championships. And then for the next year, it was trying to help him break the top 250 to 200, but he actually went backwards because he started to think about it too much. Yeah. And it was interesting to hear that at the, at the highest end of the game. It's, it's the same same problem he posed for, for Omar here when he hit 16 in the world. So it was very interested in that part. I think it was, I think it was very interesting. Um, I mean, he's, he's clearly very interested in, you know, table tennis in Egypt and where it's came and you know where, where it's came from and where it's going and obviously you know with the likes of um a Hannah Goda and those guys coming along you know it, it, they're, they're clearly doing you know great work over there I think what came across to me was how humble he was again you know the, 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 these top guys you know they're not getting carried away with where they're at they're ranking you know they're, they're not thinking they're the greatest in the world they're not thinking you know but they are the greatest in the world in our sport and it's remarkable I think a lot of the young guys you know can learn from how humble a lot of these top guys are they've got this inner self-belief but they're not you know flaunting it on the court all the time you know they're not getting mixed up you know with what the ITTF's doing complaining about this complaining about that it's all very positive and it's all focusing on their own game and their support team around them so I thought it was very 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 interesting yeah very good well he was a great guest just like so many others we've had on and now it's time for news of the week to um, talk about our guests over the last few weeks.
So we've asked our guests over the weeks about their dream team, three men, three women, with them being the team manager or, or coach. It's our turn, guys. Um, Keith, I'm going to come to you first. What, who is your dream team and why? So start off with the men's. Um, for me, it's quite easy, actually, because I've followed the, these guys um, from when I was young and, and they inspired me when I was growing up. We were lucky to actually have one of them on the show. So I'll start off with Michael Mays. Um, I think Mays speaks for himself. He, you know, no matter who he plays against, he's just got an incredible self-belief. And I think that no matter what team he's on, he will help raise the spirits and raise the attitude of his teammates. So I think he'd just be a great team man and just an all-round great fighter. Um, second on the team, I, I would have Zhang Jike. Um, there's obviously a, a big debate between Zhang Jike and Ma Long. And for me, I think Zhang Jike, he was, he, his, his career was a lot shorter than Ma Long's. Um, but what he done in his career is, you know, it's up there with the best ever. Um, and I think if, if you're comparing the best on titles, I think he's right up there with Malong. The reason he aged it for me over Malong is that his his charisma, his character, you know, I love it when he's, you know, he was ripping off the shirt and, you know, he shows that character, which is unusual from a Chinese player, which I think um, is why a lot of people, you know, kind of drew towards uh, Zhang Jike, but also I think you can't help but admire his his physique as a player. You know, he, he kind of makes table tennis look more like a support because he is such a such a strong character. Um, and then third would be Timo Ball, another lefty. I think Timo just the perfect sportsman. Um, in every way, I think you can't fault him. Um, he was at the top of the world, number one in the world. He was knocked off his throne, I think, in two thousand three after he lost to Shuike and Bursi in Paris, but he regained his number one position in the world. Um, for, for me, I think his longevity and what he's done for the sport, he's just a top, top, top guy. Um, so some yellow complete... cards, apart from Timo, some yellow cards in that team, Keith, potentially. I know, and I think maybe that's a, maybe that's a sign. I mean, maybe maybe table tennis needs to look at that and, and you know, yeah. maybe don't be so harsh with, you know, maybe yeah. get a little bit more character out in the sport. I think that is what it's lacking. And I think, you know, if you look at the likes of the, you know, the, World Championships of ping pong, you know, people are going wild, and I think it needs to be relaxed up a little bit more. It's a little bit too traditional. It needs to be a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more character. Yeah, yeah. That's that's for another uh, series about yeah, maybe series. relaxing the rules. Yeah. So moving on to my women's team, um, again, I I love Lucy Wen. I think you know she's she's obviously quite small, um, but you know her her. Ability to read the ball, her back in the backhand, and her, her ability to read the ball, and it's it's just she's definitely my favorite Chinese player. I know Ding Ning is up there, but I think Lu Xi Wen pips that spot for me. Tamara Borosh, you know, fantastic European player. Uh, I think she would get on the team because you know what she done for the sport, and I remember watching her whenever I was younger. You know, in the era of Krianga and Samsonov starting off, I remember watching her in the women's game, and she was a phenomenal, phenomenal player. Um, third, I would have Mimi, Mima Ito, um, number two in the world currently. I, I think, you know, she's just a fantastic player. And I, she, she also brings a little bit more character into the girls side of the game, I think, as well. I think she's got a lovely style. She, you know, she spins the ball when she needs to, but she hits the ball hard when she needs to. She's fantastic back in the back end. Generally, just really like watching her play as well. I thought we were only naming them then. Bloody hell, that was about 10 minutes. Well, you, I know. Some, some insight there, some insight. <laughs> John, have you got your three men and three women? Yeah, like, uh, do, do, do I have do I have uh, 10 seconds to run through after he took 10 minutes there, or how is it going to work? <laughs> insight, huh? Insight. <laughs> the data, man. I, 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 take it, I, take it, I take it, given the fact that you put Lee Chi Wen in there, that you're going to be the non-playing captain. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, you're you're not taking you're not taking the pun there, obviously. Okay, so I'll, I'll go on to uh, I'll go on to my team. I'll, I'll I'll start with my women's team, um, and I'm gonna start with Zhang Yining, obviously a double Olympic gold medalist in women's singles. Um, I think she's won everything in in table tennis. Uh, someone who dominated the game. What I what I started to come into the sport playing for Ireland, so. Really, I always looked up to Zhang Yining, and I, I just feel she's probably, in my opinion, being one of the greatest women players of all time. Um, I agree with you, Keith. I'm going to also have Nima Ito in there. Um, I feel like she she's really come through the challenge 
the Chinese women players over the last couple of years, when you're talking the depth of the Chinese women having 10 or 12 players at any World Tour event and, she, and she's able to win some of those events, it just shows you the, the level that she's at right now at 19 and, and maybe where she can go over the next you know five to 10 years. So potentially uh, a non-Olympic champion in the women's game in Nima Ito. Um, and I've gone a little bit of a curveball for my third player. Uh, I've gone for Matilda Ekholm, somebody who I rate as a player. Um, I think she has tremendous charisma, something you said, Keith, about, about players in your men's team. But I think Matilda has tremendous charisma and she, she really gets the crowd going when she plays. Um, and obviously she's a really good player in her own right, multiple Swedish champion and a top 20 player in the world. So... So I think that just gives me the balance in my women's team to to go and push for any title that we might play in. Um, if I move over to the men's team, um, I've gone with the king, Jan Ove Volner, leading my team. Um, obviously, you know, we all know what he's done in the game. Uh, he's a Grand Slam champion and, and yeah, the greatest player of all time, in, in my opinion. Um, I've gone for the steady Roger Federer of table tennis, Timo Ball, uh, as number two. Um, you know, just looking at the longevity of his career and and he's still there fighting for titles. I just think he's a really steady uh, player who's who's just shown a, a great uh, has been a great role model for for our sport. Um, and playing in the in the third position and the anchor man, I've gone for Lugu Liang. Obviously, he's also won everything. Um, I've put him in there as a pen holder, short fifth player. Um, you know, as I say, he's obviously dominated as a player. We probably more more know now as the, I haven't been the coach of the Chinese team, but I just think he brings a little bit of everything. So uh, that's my three. Um, I think I've got a really good uh, six, and I'm going to put Ryan Jenkins in as my non-playing captain. <laughs> what do you think of that, Ryan? I've been giving you a stick the whole the whole season. I've been I've been having a go at your computer and everything, but I said I'll I'll, I'll, I'll give him a bit of credit and I'll and I'll put him in as the captain of this team. Yeah, well, I'll have to decline because I'll be on the other side coaching against you because my dream team is going to beat Keith's and yours because <laughs> I've got I've gone for people I like watching more than anything and I do like the Volners and and team of balls etc. But for pure flair. And the way they play the shots for my men's team, Krianga, Calderano, and Koki Niwa. Um, could have gone for Mays, could have gone for Valna, etc. But you've stolen them already, so I'm mm -hmm. going to take a different three. Um, and for the women, Dingning, Andriana Diaz, and Elizabeth Samara. Um, I think the way they play the game, I love watching Dingning. I know Diaz and Samara, obviously a little bit lower down in the in the world rankings to the players you've chosen, but love watching them. And I think for me at the moment with table tennis is about players that I like watching more than sometimes the best players who are obviously obviously the winners. You know, they're, they're winning all the the, uh, the tournaments out there and rising up the rankings like Mimo Ita and uh, Nisha Wen, fantastic players. But with me as coach, I think I can take the three men and three women uh, to gold. With I think John Silva and Keith Bronze, I think I think that'll be it. <laughs> I, I, I can only say one thing: you 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 have to you have to have your hands probably wrapped around Cocky Neo. I don't know how you're going to keep him under control, to be honest. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll happily sit at the sideline watching you trying to trying to teach him how to play a chop lock. But I do I, I have seen that you you have been doing videos about chop lock. So no, he's inspired me. He's inspired me. He's inspired me. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. Some oh, big backhands in there, Jenko. Calderano, Crianga. Not put Ryan Jenkins back in. in. Um, well, I was going to take him in the practice hall and teach them, you know, a proper backhand. But um, <laughs> I don't know if they listen to me. But yeah, but you know, we're hoping to get Hugo on at um, on one episode, so that'll be a, a, a possibility maybe in the future and talk to him about his rise up the rankings. And but yes, yeah, um, interesting times, guys. And um, you know, we could have gone down the road of you know talking about Polish league and back or you know the German. Um, the German Cup that's uh, happened quite recently with uh, Saarbrück and winning that, or could have been about you know getting out out of lockdown, which Wales is going to be doing very shortly for elite athletes. And you know before we got got on air, John was talking about Australia and Keith, you'll have a view uh, in Northern Ireland. But we want to talk also about the last seven weeks, what's been good, you know what progress we've made. You know there have been challenges, 
but we've got through them. But you know, it's a live show, so there are going to be challenges. But I think we've done well, guys. You know, we've got good guests, very interesting. We've interacted with the, um, the you know, the, the fans and the viewers. And I think we were talking before the show, Keith. Probably about one hundred fifty thousand reach in total. You know, Spotify, YouTube, Facebook. It's been good. Yeah. Absolutely. So we've had around eight, well, we've eight episodes now, and each week they go out to about fifteen thousand app users on Facebook. Um, you know, we're getting a good few thousand uh, views there. So I mean, it's definitely going out. The feedback has been really good, really positive. Um, and I think we have to reiterate that it's you know it's about the players, it's about getting that insight knowledge because it, it, there's not much of that out there. So certainly, I think we are onto a niche in that you know we we we're, we're getting a lot more insight on a more sort of um off off record sort of you know uh, perception. It's not it's not overly serious. Put it like that. Yeah, I mean, um, but it's the challenges have come. There was a challenge, obviously, in not saying that uh, Omar says from. Uh, India was one challenge, but we got past that in the end. And all fair, John, all fair, all fair. John, John, um, the first week, obviously very nervous, like we said before. Um, but we've, you know, relaxed a bit. We have a little bit of a joke, and that came from other people telling us to be yourself on camera, wasn't it? Yeah, I feel, I feel, yeah, exactly what you said. You know, we were, we were all a little bit frozen to the screen on the first week when we, when it was just the three of us. Like, yeah, it's, it's hard to imagine that we've all developed. So well, you know, and and, and have become so comfortable um, moving through the episodes. Um, now I've just really enjoyed the different the different guests we've had on. Um, obviously, from all all parts of our game. Who was your um, favourite guest, John? If I may put you on the spot, what was your favourite? Yeah, uh, I have to say I uh, I really enjoyed uh, John Michelle Save. Um, going back here to our second episode when when we had John Michelle on, and I think he's obviously been one of the players that I would have followed and, and, and would have known off the court as well. And it was just great to have him on. Um, although I have to say, uh, very close to that is Will Bailey's one. Um, and I think Will Will just showed me what a winner he is. And, and, and you know what, I took I took things straight away into the practice from the attitude that, that, that Will uh, gave across to me on that episode. So yeah, probably those two have been my two favorite episodes. What about you, Keith? What was your favourite episode or episodes? Yeah, it's difficult. I think, um, obviously, me is growing up was my idol. So I think it's, you know, to get him on a show that we have started and we have created, obviously, I think um, it has to be me is. But um, in truth, they've all been fantastic. You know, we've learned a lot. Um, well, certainly I've learned a lot. Maybe maybe you guys have also. Um, but I, I would say, you know, to have someone like Steve on, you know, what he's done for the sport, he's a, you know, he's a legend right up there with Waldner and, you know, it, it's fantastic to get him on the show. So yeah, some some great great interviews. Yeah, I think they've all brought something different. I mean, from Craig House and to Johnny Cowan to uh, Michael Mays, John Shall Save, Will Bailey, and now Omasa. Yeah, good points of view, different points of view in many things as well, which is refreshing. But um, I'm looking forward to season two. Um, you know, we didn't want to have too many episodes in season one. Um, obviously, people are now starting to get back to to practicing and competing. So. It will be a challenge to get guests on, but um, yeah, we, we'll do it. We've got good connections. Like I said, Adam Bro is coming on. Um, we've got many more interested to come on when it suits them. Um, try and get Samsonov on and um, Matthias Falk and these type of players, uh, maybe Calderano. So season two will probably be coming by August, September time, but we'll, we'll sort that out. But in the meantime, you can get all the episodes anyway from season one on Spotify and... Um, and YouTube in the meantime, if you want to catch yeah. any that you've missed. I think there's a good, there's a very good opportunity actually for our viewers to give us feedback. You know, we're open to new ideas. I think long term, the idea would be that you guys are obviously on the circuit quite a lot. You could be at the World Championships. You could be, you know, at Pro Tours, Cadet Pro Tours, training camps. I think we've got a great opportunity actually to present those shows uh, live from different locations. Um, and you know there could be guests there. There could be so the, the the potential is endless. So I think it's give us feedback. What do you think we do good? What would you like to see more of? And hopefully we can adapt and change and make it even better for season two. Good. Any last words from you, John? No, I think season two probably. Uh, I would like to see a little bit more work done by you two guys. I think I've, I've, I have a thought, I have a sore back over the last eight weeks putting together these shows from the questions. To the to the uh, to the IT, and I have to say, I, I, I you know, 
I really feel like that I've I've had to have a I've had to have a massage after after this eight <laughs> week period you with know, the work I've done. No, no, That's... in all seriousness, uh, I really have to say, yeah, fantastic work, Ryan, from you putting all the questions together and and ultimately driving the show for that in and and Keith. The, the wonderful IT that's on show is all down to you, and I suppose I just come, I just come in and and make your life a misery, I suppose. But uh, no, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. John brings me comedy. You. There was a couple of viewers asked us, John, how did the Tinder date go? Yeah, with uh, the blazer. That was one high, like one of the blazer wearing show, which was Craig Housen show. Which one was that? Craig Housen show was, was it? Pitford, Liam Peter. Put it this way, I'm 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 still on there, so uh, couldn't have went so that good. well. <laughs> is that because is that because Ashley now is out of the picture and he's back home? Yeah, it must be, must be, yeah. <laughs> well, there we are. Well, guys, it's been good over the last eight weeks. Um, thank you to John, Keith, and myself. Uh, make sure you tune in for season two when it comes. But like I said, have a look over season one's best bits, and um, we'll see you soon. So stay safe, and let's get back to table tennis very soon. Thanks, guys. See you soon. Cheers.